Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International uh, St. Louis Patient and Family Conference. We are starting our session on AML, or acute myeloid leukemia, with the one and only Dr. Dr. Peter Westervelt, who's a professor of medicine here at Wash U School of Medicine. Good morning, and we will take your questions as you type them in. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Peter Westervelt. I am one of the here at Wash U. Um, and so we're going to talk about um, transplant um, as a treatment modality specifically for um, with respect to AML. Um, and I've uh, tried to pitch this talk at uh, the level of assuming nobody has much or any medical background. Um, I've tried to take all the jargon and, and, and really technical stuff out of it, but um, if um, Anybody has any questions as we go along for clarification or anything, feel free to stop me. This is a fairly small, cozy group, and we can try and keep it as informal as, as possible. So, um, so with that, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, specifically with respect to AML, what are the indications for transplant? Um, um, AML comes in a variety of different, or comes about in, in a variety of different ways and with different features. And um, one of the main decision points that we have, as I'll show in a couple of slides here, um, is particularly once we get people in remission, who's at high risk to uh, fail standard chemotherapy um, versus who can be potentially cured with chemotherapy, and then making the decision about transplant or not at that point. Um, we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about what a transplant involves, um, the different elements of transplant, um, and then also um, uh, spend some of the end of the talk talking about the various complications that go along with transplant and that in turn make transplant a fairly significant decision. It's a, um, uh, there's, it's a lot of weighing pros and cons. Um, so just to start off with, um, so AML uh, makes up about 1% of the U.S. cancer incidence. It confers there's about 0.5% lifetime risk of AML, about 20,000 uh, cases a year, and about 10,000 deaths a year. So significant medical problem. Um, the main thing I wanted to point out, though, with this slide is that this is primarily a disease that afflicts older adults. Um, See the, uh, the main incidence is in the fifth, sixth, seventh decades of life. And that presents a bit of a conundrum when it comes to transplant because um, um, uh, transplant uh, is often reserved for younger, fitter adults. And that's changed somewhat over the last few years, but um, uh, it's still a, a, a potential issue. So, um, the outcomes with AML vary uh, based on various prognostic factors that we can identify at the time of diagnosis as well as uh, in the course of treatment. This slide simply to show you that we can, uh, that some patients do very well with AML um, and you can see a plateau in survival here at somewhere around 50%. Uh, these tend to be patients with favorable risk um, chromosome abnormalities. At the other end of the spectrum, there are um, a number of patients that we can identify right up front that are not going to do well with standard approaches, and that uh, we, and these are the patients that we uh, try to get to transplant as soon as possible if they're in good shape and, and are candidates for transplant. And then inevitably, there are people that fall in between, and this is where we spend a lot of time agonizing them about what the right approach is. Um, so, this is just a crude. Um, um, algorithm for that sort of outlines the thought process of, of um, how we approach a, um, a, a patient with AML, in particular um, when we uh, get to the point of having to make a decision about transplant or chemotherapy. Now this algorithm um, assumes that patients are fit and medically um, well enough to, to be able to get through a stem cell transplant. Um, so I haven't talked that uh, much. Uh, addressing the um, sort of medically unfit or older patient that's not a transplant candidate here. But just to walk through it, so if you have a, a, a new AML uh, 
patient newly diagnosed with AML, our first goal um, in somebody that's fit for chemotherapy is to get them into remission. And this involves uh, typically uh, fairly intensive chemotherapy in um, some older patients uh, that we don't think are going to do real well with um, intensive chemotherapy. Uh, there are less intensive approaches that we can take that may still result in remission. But once people are in remission, um, we assimilate all the data that we collect primarily at, their, at the time of their diagnosis, things like, that we'll go through in a subsequent slide, but things like chromosome abnormalities, genetic mutations and the like, uh, to assign a, a prognostic group. And the patients that we think have a good chance of being cured with chemotherapy, um, uh, we will uh, use what's called uh, consolidation chemotherapy uh, to hopefully result in cure. Um, patients that are poor risk, uh, we will try to get the transplant as soon as we can um, once they're in remission and once we've identified a donor. And, um, uh, and then the, the people that are intermediate risk, again, are the ones that can um, can go either transplant or uh, to chemotherapy. The patients that are, uh, the, for whom a decision to treat with chemotherapy up front is made, um, unfortunately many may ultimately relapse. And once they do, um, really the only curative therapy at that time is a stem cell transplant. Um, so, uh, so the indications for, for uh, transplant and AML. So as I alluded to earlier, this is really a balancing of risk and benefit. Um, if the assessment is that the risk of the disease progressing um, and being incurable with chemotherapy alone is very high and the patient's thought to be um, in reasonably good shape, then we will um, take them to transplant on the other hand, if we think there's a reasonable chance, even if that chance is 40 or 50 percent or 30 percent even, um, we may opt to um, offer chemotherapy up front in the hope of sparing the patient the toxicity associated with transplant. Um, so again, these intermediate risk uh, patients are where we spend a lot of time sort of going back and forth about what the best approach is. And, um, and often patients, um, you know, have, well, always patients have the final say in that. Um, so the things that confer high risk or low probability of cure without a transplant in, include adverse chromosomes. So very commonly, uh, chromosome abnormalities are seen in patients with AML, particularly those that progress from uh, antecedent MDS or myeloproliferative neoplasm. And we've learned over the years um, how to assign a prognosis based on various chromosome abnormalities. Increasingly over the last few years, uh, we've also learned how to integrate uh, the presence or absence of various mutations in addition to chromosome abnormalities. Um, we also know that patients that have an antecedent MDS or myeloproliferative neoplasm um, are rarely, if ever, cured with chemotherapy alone. And those patients, um, we uh, try to get the transplant if, um, if feasible. Similarly, patients that have had prior chemotherapy or radiation, um, that in, um, in also is an indication to transplant because it's, uh, there's plenty of evidence that suggests that the um, AML that results um, in the wake of chemotherapy or radiation is rarely curable with uh, chemotherapy alone. As I mentioned in the uh, prior algorithm slide, uh, once patients have relapsed after achieving an initial remission, or for that matter, if they don't go into remission with upfront chemotherapy, um, those patients um, are also only curable with uh, transplant. And then finally, um, there's, there's also um, lots of evidence that the older you are, the less likely we can cure AML with chemotherapy alone. Um, so generally people in their 60s, if we think they're stem cell transplant candidates, um, unless they have really favorable risk cytogenetics, um, uh, we will um, certainly seriously consider stem cell transplant. So um, 
going to stem cell going to a stem cell uh, transplant requires a number of, of uh, factors or boxes to be checked. First of all, we have to find a suitable donor. Um, until recently, that meant finding um, either a fully matched sibling donor. I'm not going to go into uh, the, the details of HLA typing, but there are um, there are tests that we can do to identify um, uh, patients that are suitably matched to be able to serve as a donor. And uh, uh, a full sibling has a one in four chance of being a full HLA match. Um, and then if we can't find a fully matched donor, there are about 15 million uh, uh, potential donors registered in, uh, in donor registries worldwide uh, that we can um, uh, tap into to find a fully matched unrelated donor. The likelihood of which uh, varies depending on uh, primarily on uh, race and ethnicity. So Caucasians have about a 75% chance of finding a fully matched donor. Um, African Americans, so roughly 20%, and, and um, various other groups somewhere in between. Um, more recently, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, later on, um, there's been um, increased use of either umbilical cord um, blood uh, specimens as um, uh, sources of donor stem cells as well as haploidentical donors. So those are um, uh, donors who are half matched to, uh, the, um, to the patient. Um, so that can be a parent, can be a child, or can be a sibling that's not fully matched, but, but half matched. Um, and um, increasingly, we've uh, gained comfort and experience in doing this, and outcomes are arguably uh, as good uh, although we have to do the transplant in a somewhat different way to account for those differences. Uh, importantly, uh, we have to, the, the patient has to be in reasonably good shape, uh, meaning a relative lack of comorbidities. Um, so um, they, the patient has to, um, for example, not have just had a heart attack or um, have really bad diabetes and neuropathy and, um, also has to have a reasonably good performance status, and that means being able to get up and do activities of daily living, not spending all day um, in bed or on the sofa because they're so um, weak. Um, and then finally, and, and I deliberately listed age as the third criteria here, because age is really one of the things that tends to correlate with the first two, but it's not an absolute, and, and you can all imagine that there are 72-year-olds that are in much better shape than, say, 55-year-olds based on comorbidities and performance status. So um, age is, a, is one of those relative things that, um, but that being said, I think it's, um, it's unusual for us to transplant somebody much above the age of, say, 75. Um, um, and there are uh, ways of, uh, of integrating all of these factors um, into prognostic scoring systems that uh, attempt to predict outcomes with transplant. Um, there's a well-known system called the SOAR score that um, we use to, um, just as a way of, of putting a number on the, the general feel that one gets for evaluating a patient as a potential uh, transplant recipient. And then the final um, uh, requirement for transplant, ideally at least, is remission. And um, there are certainly, there's plenty of data that shows that if we can take somebody to transplant in remission, the likelihood of a good outcome, which is being alive and free of disease five years later, um, is much higher in patients that go to transplant in remission than those that are transplanted with active disease. Um, uh, that said, we, you know, we certainly have transplanted people with active disease, but um, it's a much higher um, risk type setting for, uh, for a bad outcome. Dr. Westervelt, we have a question from the audience um, online. Mm -hmm. Want to know under comorbidities, their, yeah. doctor, um, their doctor said that things like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and other autoimmune diseases could be considered comorbid. Do you have a different definition, or should this... Uh, patient be concerned? 
Uh, so that's, those are, are certainly comorbid conditions that um, can undoubtedly have an impact on things like performance status and ability to, um, to get through the rigors of, of a stem cell transplant. And, you know, there are things that have to be integrated into the, into the, um, into the discussion. Um, and like all things, it's a matter of degree, I think. Thank you, Dr. Westervelt. Doctor, I have a couple questions, I'm, and I'm going to tell you right off the bat. I'm sorry if these aren't good questions, but the first one is, <laughs> can you cure uh, the AML or with, with uh, chemo? Is it possible? Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, the the as I we can go back to the well. Um, so in, in, a, in a prior slide here, um, I listed um, the, you know, the various things that we integrate into that. Um, but, just, yeah, so you can see here, um, in these favorable risk patients here are primarily treated with chemotherapy. So the, um, uh, there is a substantial subset of patients with AML, tends to be younger patients, it tends to be patients with favorable risk cytogenetics, or at least intermediate risk cytogenetics, uh, but can be cured with chemotherapy alone. The people that, that are um, rarely cured with chemotherapy alone are those who develop AML in the wake of something like MDS or myelofibrosis, um, or have had say, chemotherapy for breast cancer or Hodgkin's disease, for example, or radiation. Um, um, and those patients are, are, as I said, rarely cured with, with chemotherapy alone. We use chemotherapy to get them into remission, but then when we're faced with the choice of um, do, we, uh, do we go to chemotherapy after that or transplant, those are the patients that um, we preferentially take the transplant. Uh, thank you. And the second question is, so with the donor, yeah. it's a perfect match. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the health of the donor. If it takes a while before a person develops AML, and it takes a while for them to get to that transplant stage, the donor's getting older all the time. So in their health, you know, as they get older, will deteriorate. Is there, can you take the stem cell from a donor and keep that stem cell and use it at a later time? Technically, yes. In practice, um, rarely. Um, and most of the time, um, you know, we're talking about a span of a year or two. For example, if we, um, you know, if we're sort of intermediate risk and, and we decide we're going to defer transplant and, give people chemotherapy in the hopes that we can cure them, but they ultimately relapse. Typically, we're talking the span of a year or two, and um, you know, somebody that's 65 at the time that they, you know, that this all had, a donor that's 65 at 67 is not gonna be a significantly worse potential donor at that time. Now, you know, things can happen, but, um, uh, but it, it would be, Rarely would be the case where we would collect the donor for the eventuality of, um, of doing a transplant in the future, but, um, but not immediately. Now, we will often type donors, even in this scenario where the intermediate risk patient's going go to go to chemotherapy, we will often type their siblings and even do a preliminary unrelated donor search just to have gotten that out of the way to, um, for the possibility that they relapse in the future. We're not starting from scratch at that point. We know what the donor situation is at that time. Um, insurance companies are variably um, on board with doing it. You know, but if we're able to get it paid for, we will often do that. So, Thank so, you. And there are no stupid questions. So. <laughs> you know what I... I I got to ask this question because if I don't, I'll be you know, I'll be mad at myself. But you mentioned the um, umbilical cord. Uh -huh. uh, so with the umbilical cord, uh, naturally, we don't have mine. I don't have my children. 
but my grandchildren, if we were to save our grandchildren in biblical court, could they be a match for someone? Uh, there are companies that do that um, for you, and the answer is maybe, but um, depending on the degree of match. So umbilical, there are um, most, if, you know, the vast majority of umbilical cord transplants that are done are done um, using cords from banks of, of uh, cords that are stored that are anonymously put into the banks. They're typed when they're put in. There's a there's a HLA typing requirement or an HLA match requirement for cords that's not as rigorous as for um, uh, historically what we've had to type uh, or match for uh, you know adult donors, uh, but they're not designated from um, the time of the, you know, the birth of the child to, to go to a particular person. So, I appreciate that. I won't ask you any more questions. <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> you're fine, and they're all good questions. So. Well, um, so feel free. And your questions are appreciated by the online <laughs> folks. They're they're very grateful that you ask that because that question comes up amongst a lot of our patients who call, as well as the folks who are watching with us online today. So no dumb questions. You're asking. You're speaking on behalf of patients across the U.S. Thank you. And one other thing I'd say about umbilical cord: uh, there are some centers that do a lot of umbilical cord transplants. Um, others, like ourselves. Um, Apoidentical transplants when we can't find a fully matched donor. Um, it's uh, the, there have been studies done with both um, independently that have shown relatively equivalent outcomes. There's a study comparing the two approaches that um, was recently completed that we're waiting on data from, but they're both reasonable approaches. I will say that for most patients, the ability to, we will be able to find a haploidentical donor for most patients because of the fact that most people have kids or living parents or siblings that are half matched. So, um, uh, and, you know, for patients where we can't, you know, there are certainly, uh, uh, there's also a good chance that we can find a cord. So, in this day and age, um, we are rarely in a situation where a patient that needs a stem cell transplant can't get it for lack of a donor. Um, quick question on um, chemotherapy before path. Uh -huh. How um, long generally is that process? And then is there maintenance limitations once you're free? So, um, so good question. Um, so the typical, um, so the, the initial induction chemotherapy is given over a week and then it's usually a month to recover. And then in the patients that we go on to get consolidation chemotherapy to, um, uh, it's a, typically a five-day regimen um, given every four weeks or so, or four cycles. Um, and then um, at this, in this day and age, post-completion of, of therapy, there's no maintenance that's been shown to improve things. And, uh, that may change as, as more targeted therapies come along that, um, uh, that may get validated as um, potential maintenance regimens. But as of right now, when you finish that chemotherapy, you're done. And that's why, that's one of the things that's attractive about chemotherapy and why if we think there's a fighting chance that we can cure somebody's leukemia with chemotherapy alone, um, it's certainly worth considering. Um, as opposed to transplant, which comes with some baggage. Okay. We, we, we got, got it. That's everybody yeah. online so far. We're, we're up to speed. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Westervelt. And thanks again, everyone here, because your questions really do are on behalf of patients across the U.S. who are watching or will watch later this week. Okay, so, um, so talking a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of transplant. So, um, so the sources of the cells that we use, the cells that we're transplanting. Um, I put up here as a first bullet point, autologous versus allogeneic. And the point is that you may have heard that some patients get transplanted with their own cells, or so-called autologous uh, stem cell transplant. Um, and it's that, that approach has been tried and tested in um, patients with 
AML and MDS and other types of leukemia in the past. Um, and I think it's safe to say in this day and age, rarely if ever used. Um, um, it's uh, attractive in the sense that the complications and mortality risks with an autologous transplant are um, relatively low compared to an allogeneic donor transplant, um, but unfortunately ineffective in terms of curing disease. Um, so everything that we're going to talk about today uh, refers to an allogeneic or a donor transplant. Um, as I alluded to earlier, um, our donors can be either a related sibling donor or an unrelated donor um, uh, called from the registry, right? one of the worldwide registries. Um, and now increasingly, um, over the last, say, 10 or so years, um, the use of haploidentical donors or alternatively umbilical cord blood specimens as an alternative donor source. And then finally, um, in addition to umbilical cord blood specimens, we can also, um, the, the two main um, sources of cells that we collect are uh, bone marrow, um, so we can harvest bone marrow cells uh, from a donor, or alternatively, uh, we can uh, mobilize the stem cells out of the bone marrow into the peripheral blood where we can then collect them through a procedure called apheresis. And I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of, of, um, of the donor source here in a second. So, um, so stem cell apheresis is depicted in the picture on the right here. So this is basically a procedure where um, a donor is mobilized using um, a five-day regimen of subcutaneous injections of a drug called Neupogen, um, which is a white blood cell growth factor. It again mobilizes the cells out of the bone marrow transiently into the peripheral blood where they circulate around for a few days. Um, and then on the fifth day, the patient comes in, uh, or the donor comes in, and uh, undergoes this um, apheresis procedure, which takes about takes a few hours. And essentially, they're connected to this machine that basically runs blood from in this case, one arm through the machine, and then it's returned back into the other arm. Um, and the machine basically sorts out the stem cells uh, from everything else and returns everything else. And we're left with a bag that's enriched with hematopoietic stem cells. Um, about a third of the patients, roughly, um, may require a central venous catheter to do this. So part of the assessment of the donor um, by the paresis centers to determine whether their veins are adequate to withstand the, um, the high flow rate that's uh, required to do this procedure. In that event, the, they typically will put the catheter in the morning of and take it out um, uh, after the procedure is completed. Um, many times we can do this in a single day. Um, sometimes um, it requires two or even three Day, um, consecutive uh, procedures um, over a two or three day period. Uh, on the other hand, the bone marrow harvest um, is, um, is a surgical procedure. So it's done in the operating room, typically takes an hour or two, usually done under general anesthesia. And um, at our center, we hospitalize these people overnight for observation. Typically, people recover over a week or two. There's some stiffness, soreness um, on the back of the hip. As you can see, we, this is a procedure done on both sides of the hip. It's essentially like a bone marrow biopsy only. Instead of taking a few cc's, we'll take a liter or up to a couple liters of, um, of liquid bone marrow. Um, so as you can imagine, um, uh, there's um, it's certainly easier on donors to have the, to undergo a, a peripheral blood mobilization than go through a marrow harvest. From the recipient standpoint, um, the advantage is it's a little bit less time to recovery of blood counts post transplant. Um, at least in the autologous stem cell transfer, the autologous transplant setting, there's no real difference in outcomes. Uh, both work. Um, on the other hand. Um, with bone marrow, we do see less uh, of one of the major complications of stem cell transplantation, 
uh, particularly um, chronic graft versus host disease, which we'll talk about. And at least in children, um, as well as uh, adults with aplastic anemia, um, there's some evidence that there's a survival benefit with marrow um, due to the relative lack of chronic graft versus host disease. Um, uh, which is not to say that we never see graft versus host disease, it's just less with, um, uh, with bone marrow. I have a question. Yeah. So, in terms of quantity, mm -hmm. do you get comparable amount from both? Um, yeah. So, um, the, the number of stem cells that we collect is, um, or that we, we attempt to collect is uh, based on the weight of the recipient. And, um, but the, uh, we often are able to collect more cells with a peripheral blood mobilized product, uh, but they're roughly comparable. Um, so. Okay, so, um, so what are the elements of the process? What's involved in coming in and getting a stem cell transplant? Um, so I'm gonna go through each one of these things, um, and I'm gonna show you a timeline here in a second, but. Uh, essentially, um, we give what's called a conditioning regimen. So this is chemotherapy or radiation that's administered prior to the transplant infusion, immediately prior, meaning a few days uh, leading up to the transplant. Uh, this is then followed by an infusion of the stem cells from the donor. And thereafter requires um, suppression of the immune system. And that's an open-ended um, thing that can persist for months or even years. And then um, throughout all of this, we're providing supportive care to uh, prevent the types of complications that we can see. So this is a general timeline of sort of a uncomplicated allogeneic stem cell transplant. I'll just walk through it um, um, briefly. So, for, whoops, uh, so first of all, um, um, uh, it, it's, we tell people to prepare to be in the hospital for about a month or so. Um, that's open-ended and that, that assumes that, um, that everything's going to go smoothly, but with an uncomplicated stem cell transplant, it's typically about a week or so where we're giving the conditioning. So they, they um, admit we typically put in a central venous catheter the day that they come in. Um, and then they start their conditioning, which again is the chemotherapy or radiation that um, precedes the transplant. On um, what we call day zero, um, they'll get their infusion of stem cells. It's the period of usually 10 days, two weeks or so that follows the transplant. We see a lot of the peritransplant morbidity or um, patients feel um, tired, run down, their blood counts are low. They're typically getting transfusions. Um, they will often have some uh, what's called mucositis or skin breakdown in the inside of their mouth or in the GI tract. Um, generally, this is when people don't feel so, got, uh, so hot in the post-transplant setting. Um, depending on the type of transplant, whether it's haplo or marrow or stem cells, typically two, sometimes up to three weeks later, um, we'll see count recovery. This is when the, the transplanted cells start churning out uh, white blood cells and red blood cells and platelets. Typically, that's also when people start feeling better, uh, better after this post-transplant mater. And then it's usually a few days after that, people get to go home. We want to make sure that they're up, walking around, eating, drinking, able to basically do what you need to be able to do to not be in the hospital. Um, we'll typically um, uh, repeat a bone marrow biopsy around day 30 or so post-transplant, give or take a few days. Um, and, then, um, and then repeated marrows typically 3, 6, 12 months later to monitor for um, ongoing remission and engraftment. So down below I've listed some of the other things that are happening simultaneously. So um, to get to your question about the timing of, of donor um, stem cell collection. So this is typically choreographed to happen so that at precisely the moment we need to infuse the stem cells, the donor's been mobilized and collected. So this is happening typically while the patient's getting um, uh, their stem cell infusion, uh, 
getting in the raw conditioning regimen. The immunosuppression that we need to administer to prevent graft-versus-host disease begins typically a day or two prior to transplant and then continues for at least a few months post-transplant. Once people get out to three or four months post-transplant in the absence of graft-versus-host disease, we will try to, we will plan to um, gradually taper the immunosuppression off. But it's not uncommon for people to remain on immunosuppression for months or even years. And that's uh, dictated entirely by the presence or absence of GDHD. Speaking of which, um, so the risk of GDHD begins at the time of cow recovery. So we don't see this immune-mediated complication of transplant that we'll talk about um, shortly until the cells come in. It's the, the white blood cells of the donor that basically mediate this. And this risk can persist, again, for, for months or years. And it's really important that people understand that going into transplant, that this is not something like going in and having your gallbladder taken out or your knee replaced, where there's a perioperative period and a recovery period, and then a week or a month or two later, it's in the rear view mirror. This is, the transplant happens on day zero, but the process of it is really a, a, a um, prolonged or indefinite type of um, issue. And that means that during this period, there's lots of follow-up. So typically in the immediate post-transplant setting, we're seeing patients once a week in clinic, often getting labs twice a week uh, to monitor. And then as we get farther out, that starts to space out as, you know, if everything's going well. Um, so a few words about conditioning regimens. As I said, the, this is the chemotherapy or radiation Sometimes we administer something called um, thymoglobulin, um, which is a anti-T-cell antibody treatment to try and reduce graft versus host disease. This is what's given immediately pre-transplant during that week or so um, uh, following admission to the hospital um, and prior to the transplant. So the purpose of the conditioning regimen is twofold. One is to take out the immune system of the recipient. Um, so if we just transplanted somebody else's stem cells, they would invariably be rejected by a functioning immune system. So we have to ablate the immune system of the recipient as a precondition of um, a, a subsequent donor transplant. And then to a variable degree, the uh, conditioning regimen may also serve to reduce the burden of the cancer cells that we're trying to get rid of. And I say to a variable degree because um, we vary the intensity of the conditioning regimen based on um, not only the disease, but primarily the fitness, the age, the fitness of the recipient. The higher intensity conditioning regimens are um, significantly more toxic and lead to more treatment related morbidity and mortality. So generally, myeloblative or intensive conditioning regimens are limited to younger, healthier adults. And again, that's a moving target as to what you define that as. Um, but importantly, ablating or destroying the mirror of the host with the conditioning regimen is not a, a necessarily a precondition of successful transplant. And uh, we know now that reduced intensity conditioning can, in fact, extend the availability of transplant as an option to a wider spectrum of patients that are in need. And you'll recall one of the first slides I showed you is that AML is primarily a disease of older adults, um, and many of whom are not um, good candidates for myeloblative conditioning. Um, so, uh, so What's the purpose of reduced intensity conditioning? So, um, so a reduced in intensity conditioning regimen primarily focused on ablating the immune system of the host. Um, and as such, what we're doing is trying to set the stage for the immune system to attack and destroy any residual leukemia cells. And we refer to this as GVL or graft-versus-leukemia. 
Um, and it's thought that that's the major long-term therapeutic um, uh, modality of a, of a donor stem cell transplant. Um, whether it, the condition is myeloablative or reduced intensity. And the advantage of this is that uh, we, it carries relatively minimal toxicity in the peritransplant setting uh, compared to myeloablative conditioning. Um, but unfortunately, it comes with minimal reduction of the, um, uh, of the burden of, of cancer cells that we're trying to get rid of, um, up front at least. So, um, so this slide sort of lists advantages and disadvantages of, of reduced intensity conditioning. So as I said, it's feasible for older, frailer, potentially sicker adults. Um, it's really ideal in more indolent malignancies that are particularly sensitive to GVL. Um, so AML, unfortunately, is a more, tends to be a more aggressive um, type of uh, malignancy. So whenever possible, um, we try and uh, uh, administer myeloblative conditioning. Um, and there's actually uh, a clinical trial that compare those two approaches uh, in patients with high-grade MDS and AML uh, that were thought to, they were older, but thought to be able to withstand a myeloblative conditioning regimen. And, um, the results of that study was that um, patients that got myeloblative conditioning had better outcomes, in particular, lower risks of relapse than reduced intensity. Um, so, and, and again, um, the, the, um, uh, this approach of, of reduced intensity conditioning, however, has been shown to be feasible in older patients that aren't candidates for myeloblative conditioning. So this is one of the um, in addition to who should go to transplant, the next thing that we have to often wrestle with is how much um, intensity in terms of condition do we think somebody can withstand. Right? So I suppose this pre-conditioning would uh, pretty much kill the immune system of the recipients. Right. So yeah. you would, I would assume this would actually make the patients more susceptible, susceptible to infections. Right. Is there a way to revert that? prior, like if that happens, in order to allow the transplant? Um, so, infection is one of the major uh, complications of transplant that, um, that we try to prevent or avoid. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, with a successful stem cell transplant, the immune system of the donor becomes the immune system of the recipient. And as time goes on and we're able to wean back immunosuppression, and I'll talk a little bit about this um, as we go forward, um, the immune system of the, now the, the, well, the donor system transplanted into the recipient uh, becomes increasingly able to um, take on the burden of fighting off infection. But, as I said, the, um, removing the roadblock that the recipient's immune system um, serves as um, to transplant, removing that roadblock is, the, is an essential thing that we have to do. As a follow-on to that question from somebody at home, um, the question is that um, you've got, in the, you mentioned in one of the previous slides about maybe ongoing immunosuppression mm -hmm. in the patient um, and you indicated that it could be months, if not years. And so I, uh, some of our viewers and folks at home are wondering, how long does that, I mean, obviously there's, there's every patient's different. You kind of got to watch the labs and play it by ear. But could somebody theoretically stay on, on mild immunosuppressants for life? Um, in theory, yes. Um, many times when we get, you know, five, ten years out, um, uh, you know, we are, tapering immunosuppression off um, gradually over that period of time. Yes, I have patients that are five or ten years post-transplant that are still having graft versus host disease, still requiring immunosuppression. Um, and you mentioned labs. Um, unfortunately, there is no lab that tells us what level of immunosuppression we need to administer. And so it's a dynamic process where um, the right amount of immunosuppression is 
just that amount that's required to keep graft versus host disease at bay and not a bit more, but it's the, the process of figuring that out is we taper it and if gradually, and then if um, graft versus host disease um, re-emerges, then we have to go back up on it. So it's a dynamic process that, um, um, that plays out over months and sometimes years. Thank you, Dr. Westervelt. That's very helpful. Okay, any other questions? How are we doing for time? I, I actually can't see the clock on this. Anyone want to tell me what time it is? 11.20. At 11, if we're at 11.20, we're doing great. Okay. Yeah, so the conditioning regimen is tailored to both the disease and the patient, uh, and the, you know, the patient's age, comorbidity, et cetera. Sure. So I think we've covered this slide, so moving on. So, um, so what are the complications of, of an allogeneic uh, donor stem cell transplant? So, alluded a lot to uh, graft versus host disease, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Some of the other complications include infection. This is, um, at least in part, a direct uh, reflection of a result of the immunosuppression that we use to treat or prevent graft versus host disease. Graft failure is um, also a potential complication, and basically what that means is we haven't done a good enough job with the immune ablation, and the, there's enough residual immune function of the recipient to immunologically reject the graft. Um, technically, it's, different, it's a little different from there's a, another scenario that we um, sometimes deal with where what's there is all donor cells, but there's just not enough of them. So poor graft function is also a potential um, complication, if you will, of stem cell transplant that in either case may require an additional infusion of cells. Um, organ toxicity is also fairly common, um, the, you know, especially in the immediate post-transplant uh, period. People are recovering from the conditioning regimen that we've given. And I'll, I've got a slide that sort of summarizes some of that. Treatment-related mortality is a significant uh, issue with the donor transplant. And, um, it varies depending on um, the condition of the patient going into transplant, but as a rough number, I tell people that it's about a one in four chance of treatment-related or transplant-related mortality, um, typically related to, to these things up here. And then finally, I, I listed on here, it's not a, a complication of transplant, but it's a, I guess, a source of treatment failure which is we get people through a stem cell transplant and their disease comes back nonetheless. And the risk of that varies, again, depending upon the condition that we're transplanting people for, um, and also the degree of, or the status of their disease at transplant. So patients that go to transplant with active disease um, have a very high rate of, of uh, relapse post-transplant. Even patients that are technically in remission, but we can detect their cancer cells using very sensitive tests like flow cytometry or something called PCR, um, 
Those patients are also at higher risk of relapse than patients for whom there's no detectable cancer cells um, at the time of transplant, even though we know that they're still there because all the evidence suggests that without a transplant, they're still going to relapse. So, um, so these are what we're, what we're trying to avoid. Um, um, so GVHD, so this, as if, I said, is... Before you go into GVHD, Dr. Westerville, I'm sorry, I have a question at home. Um, and I know we, we talk about the negative side effects of, of transplant, but I wanted you all to hear something positive. This is Terry. She's watching at home. She has a son who's 23 now. He's eight years post-transplant. He had MDS diagnosed pediatric, although technically that's be kind of between pediatric and adult, um, and he's doing really well. He had AML as well. They're just talking about it recently and helping him understand a little bit about how his body works now, eight years post-transplant. And her question is, is his body going to try and produce some of his own cells, or is it only donor cells that his body produces? I think she's trying to understand it as a parent, but also to communicate that to her now adult son. And I think it might be helpful for our patients, our pediatric patients in particular, as they try to explain this to their um, hopefully growing up quickly uh, kids who've been through transplant. So, so the answer is that, uh, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> first thing I said. Um, yes. And yes. that's the outcome that we strive for. Um, and um, so, for most patients that um, survive and are in remission and are essentially cured their transplant um, years later, um, they are what we call a chimera, which is a mixture of donor and recipient cells. And the donor cells are the cells that are in the bone marrow, the blood cells, uh, the bone marrow cells and the blood cells that they make. Occasionally, there will be patients uh, who will have a mixture of donor and recipient um, uh, in terms of their blood cells, um, but the rest of them are what they were born with, which is recipient. So um, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Westervelt. And uh, I, I, first thing I said to Terry was congratulations on behalf of all of us here. Um, but, uh, but thank you very much. Um, and and I'll, I'll suggest that um, to anyone watching, uh, that it's, this is a really good question to take to your um, hematologist, oncologist, um, particularly now that you're, if your kids, years past, your past transplant, it's always good to have maybe a follow-on appointment five years later and sort of just do a quick check-in. Uh, but these are great questions to ask, and now I think I may need to do a webinar on being a chimera. Chimera <laughs> <laughs> is a, it refers back to ancient Greek mythology. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so yeah, so graft versus host disease. So it's really the, the major barrier, I think, to uh, a um, successful outcome apart from, from relapse. Um, and when patients die from uh, stem cell transplantation, you know, it's usually or frequently because of either graft versus host disease or the infections that result from our attempts to treat graft versus host disease or often a combination of both. So a lot of the work that's going into improving outcomes post transplant is aimed at um, better preventing or dealing with this. Um, and this basically results from the fact that apart from ident an identical twin, everybody else out there, whether they're an HLA match view or not, are different. And you know, even if it's a fully matched sibling donor, there are enough differences um, between you and your donor that the donor's immune system can identify those. And what the, what the immune system um, doesn't recognize itself, it, it is basically programmed to attack. Um, and so what this requires is uh, typically a post-transplant immunosuppressive medication to either prevent or subsequently treat. There are some approaches that involve depleting the, the T cells that cause graft-versus-host disease from the graft prior to, tra to transplant that um, can replace the need for immunosuppression those, um, you know, the concern with that is that the very cells that, uh, that we deplete, the T cells that are depleted from the graft, are also what we rely on for this graft versus leukemia effect that um, we're trying to achieve here. So, um, um, so most of, certainly most of the transplants that we do here are, um, uh, 
are in conjunction with immunosuppression uh, to address graft-versus-host disease. And then um, graft-versus-host disease um, uh, involves acute uh, manifestations that are typically seen in weeks to months post-transplant and uh, also similar but, but also different effects that we see months to years post-transplant. And I've got a couple slides on these that we'll talk about. So uh, again, weeks to months, uh, typically um, or exclusively really um, in the wake of um, engraftment of the, um, of the donor cells um, is uh, when we see acute graft versus host disease. And this typically affects the skin in the form of rashes, the GI tract, um, in the form of nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, um, and the liver, and primarily in the form of, uh, of jaundice. Um, depending on the donor type and the immunosuppression, um, typical incidence, roughly 30 to 50 percent of the patients going through a transplant will have some degree of acute graft versus host disease. And it can be a source of substantial um, uh, morbidity or sickness or and a significant risk of mortality. The way we treat it is we basically escalate the immune suppression. So the standard treatment for, graft, for acute graft versus host disease is steroids, prednisone, um, solumedrol, for example, added to the medication that we have people on from the beginning to try and prevent it in the first place. Um, the risk factors for graft versus host disease um, I've listed here, so age, the degree of, of match between donor and recipient, some evidence that um, gender disparity between donor and recipient can contribute to risk of GBHD. We, for some reason, have to scale back the um, prophylaxis because of, of, say, liver toxicity that, that uh, prevents us giving old doses of methotrexate. That can, also contribute to GBHD risk factors. There's some evidence that higher doses of total body irradiation given as part of conditioning can um, set the stage more for graft versus host disease. Um, and then so chronic graft versus host disease, in contrast, typically we see emerging months to years post-transplant. And it is somewhat different in its presentation from acute GBHD, so very commonly people will develop dryness or soreness of their mouth. They can develop mouth sores and um, uh, they can make it difficult to eat. Um, dryness of irritation of their eyes uh, is, is also very common. Um, uh, the skin is also very commonly affected with chronic graft versus host disease. Unlike the acute setting, it often takes on um, rather than a red sunburn-like rash that we see with acute GDHD. With chronic, uh, we're often dealing with hyperpigmentation. Um, so Caucasians will become darker skin. Sometimes we can see what's called vitiligo. So in African Americans, they can get patches of, of light skin coloring. And then also, more significantly, uh, thickening of the skin. So similar to an autoimmune disease called scleroderma, where the skin becomes thick and often the joints become um, um, relatively immobile. Um, and a significant um, source of um, uh, detriment to quality of life. And then um, often later on, uh, often uh, later than some of these others, people can also develop um, difficulty breathing, very similar to what's called COPD. Um, and so pulmonary graft versus host disease can be a major source of morbidity and, and also mortality. Um, and um, so risk factors for chronic graft versus host disease, probably the most significant is the prior existence of acute graft versus host disease kind of stands to reason. Again, older age of the recipient, gender disparity between donor and recipient, um, unrelated donors historically have had higher rates of graft versus host disease than, um, than fully matched related donors. Um, also, the donor um, stem cell source I uh, alluded to earlier. So, um, there's plenty of evidence now that um, bone marrow is a source of 
Uh, donor stem cells is associated with a lower risk of chronic graft versus host disease than peripheral blood stem cells in the unrelated donor setting. Um, and, and then degree of mismatch. Doctor, I've got a question from a patient. Thanks, sir. Um, Jennifer's watching from home. She says hi. Um, she is an MDS patient, and she's five years post-transplant, so she would have been high risk. Um, so she's 63 now. Um, so on the younger side, at 58, when she had her tra when she had her transplant, she's now down to taking half a milligram of I'm going to say this t wrong, um, tacrolimus. Yep per day. Her doctor says her immunity has never really come back up to a good level. She has a low CD4. Mm -hmm. She's had GVHD since a month or so after transplant. Um, and doesn't the, ta the TACRO keep the immune system low? Or are those different things? So, um, so again, congratulations. <laughs> Yay. Um, and um, yes, the tacrolimus, um, the, so the, the purpose of tacrolimus is to reign in the immune system to um, manage, to keep at bay uh, the donor immune system from causing graft-versus-host disease. While our goal is to taper it off and facilitate um, full donor um, immunity, or full ability to prevent infection, um, we are, we're not always able to do that. And I think this is a great example of what I alluded to in a prior slide of the, the, the months to years aspect of not only graft versus host disease risk, but the consequent need for immunosuppression. So the lower CD4 count is, um, is you know, not surprising in that setting. Um, hopefully um, over time, if the GVHD remains at bay, the, you know, we often try to gradually taper um, off even further, um, you know, in our I mean, I've got a lot of patients that will go from a half a milligram attack daily to three times a week to twice a week to once a week. And um, it, it's when we get that far out, it's often a very gradual process of, um, of tapering, but um, unfortunately not an uncommon situation. Um, so, and, but every case is different. Right. Um. Thank you very much, Dr. Westervelt. And um, again, congratulations, Jennifer. We're all really happy for you. Okay, so uh, turning now to infectious complications. And again, this is the consequence to the price we pay for, for suppressing the immune system. And so infection, uh, infection risk comes from a variety of sources. Um, in the immediate peritransplant period, when we're dealing with the toxicity of conditioning regimen, um, uh, neutropenia or low neutrophil counts um, is a very, you know, it is almost universal. That certainly contributes in a major way to the risk of infection. Um, the, the immunosuppression that we provide, tacrolimus, um, uh, things like Salsap, cyclosporins often a substitute for tacrolimus. Um, steroids, uh, particularly in patients that have graft versus host disease. Um, all suppress the immune system from doing its job. And then importantly, disruption of mucosal barriers. So when we give people high doses of chemotherapy or radiation, mucositis or breakdown of the lining of the mouth and the GI tract um, is very common. And that's essentially the fence that keeps the bacteria on their side of the, the fence and not getting into your bloodstream. So when that's disrupted, the risk of infection um, is much higher than, say, somebody with a neutrophil kind of 0.2, but intact mucosal barriers. So, um, so mucosal barrier disruption is a major risk factor for infection in the peritransplant period um, as we're um, you know, dealing with the toxicity of conditioning. But as I mentioned also, in patients that have um, graft versus host disease, those mucosal linings are also a uh, target of the immune system in graft versus host disease. So people that have a lot of diarrhea with acute graft versus host disease are at risk because of the, the lining of the GI tract that's disrupted. For patients that have a lot of um, oral chronic graft versus host disease in the same way. So. Um, so these are some of the things that contribute to the, the risk of infection that we deal with. 
And then the infections themselves that we see run the gamut from, from bacterial infections, things like E. coli or staph or strep, uh, to fungal infections. These are things like yeast or mold infections that are common in the environment and are often common colonizers. They live in or on you all the time. And with an intact immune system, they don't cause any problems because the immune system is capable of, of keeping them at bay. Similarly, viral infections, um, a very common viral infection that we deal with is something called cytomegalovirus that about three quarters of people have been exposed to, usually an upper respiratory infection that just goes away on its own and then goes into hiding, but when we suppress the immune system, it can come back. Um, and then finally, parasitic infections, things like pneumocystis pneumonia that are often seen in patients with HIV or AIDS. Um, so how do we deal with this? So um, there's, um, there are a lot of supportive care um, that goes into trying to prevent infections. So for example, uh, we know that we can largely prevent pneumocystis infection by giving antibiotics like Bactrim or, or Dapsone or, or others. Similarly, with um, cytomegalovirus, there's a drug called Prevamis that's now available that's been shown to reduce the risk of reactivation of CMV in patients that, are, that carry the virus post-transplant. Um, herpes zoster, or shingles, chickenpox virus. Um, uh, we uh, keep people on um, antiviral medicine to try and prevent that from happening. Uh, farther down the line, um, uh, we can potentially vaccinate for that. Fungal infections, we keep people on antibiotics that, um, that target those when they're at their period of highest risk. Um, encapsulated bacteria, things like strep and, um, and other uh, bacteria, um, particularly in patients that have chronic graft-versus host disease, um, will often have people on penicillin to try and prevent that. Specifically around CMV, we monitor for uh, reactivation of that virus and, uh, because we can see evidence of it early on in the course of infection, it can reactivate and we'll see evidence in the blood even before it starts to cause actual infection symptoms. And then we can intervene with antiviral therapy when that happens. And then finally, um, immune globulin. So this is a, a protein that your body makes normally to try and prevent infection that um, is often low in um, people whose immune system doesn't work well. And, um, what's important to realize about immune globulin is that we can supplement it. We can collect um, immunoglobulin from normal donors and then infuse it as a treatment to try and prevent infection. Just briefly, graft rejection I alluded, alluded to earlier. So um, this is where um, uh, the immune system of the recipient rejects the graft. So, more commonly seen in patients with um, that get unrelated donor transplants or transplants from mismatched donors. If we have to deplete the T cells from the graft up front, that can increase the risk. If the cell dose is limited, if we don't collect enough cells from the donor, um, it uh, increases the risk of graft rejection. And then finally, um, in the setting where we're doing a transplant, where there's differences between donor and recipient match, um, and specifically in the so-called HLA genes. So this is primarily in the haploidentical setting, um, but can also be in the setting of um, a mismatched unrelated donor, or sometimes, let's say, a five out of six related donor. The recipient can have pre-existing antibodies against the donor HLA um, uh, proteins that uh, increases the risk of graft rejection. And so when we're choosing a donor that doesn't match the recipient, one of the things we're doing is screening for the presence of these donor-specific antibodies. Um, and if we have a choice of one that, that you know, doesn't share these antigens, uh, we're gonna go with that donor preferentially. And there are some, there are strategies that we can employ, say if we only have one potential donor, but there are antibodies against them, we can do some treatments um, prior to the transplant to try and remove those antibodies. But if we can avoid it, we have it. And then finally, when we do deal with graft rejection, um, um, then it's usually a, um, an indication to get more cells, either from the original donor 
um, uh, or um, sometimes or oftentimes when there's actual rejection of the graft immunologically, we will uh, try and get a different donor. Um, so all's not lost when this happens, although it's certainly a significant problem. Okay, so. Um, and then, so uh, some of the um, other uh, complications of transplant, specifically organ-related toxicity. Um, so this runs the gamut um, of, um, of vital organs, I guess. Um, so the liver can, um, uh, can become irritated from a number of, of, of um, side effects of transplant. So these can include um, the chemotherapy or the radiation that we use. There's a condition called venal occlusive disease uh, where blood flow through the liver becomes compromised. This is typically uh, seen in the immediate post-transplant setting, usually days to a um, you know, week or two uh, post-transplant. Uh, there's a drug now that's available that um, is effective at, um, at treating that. Uh, lungs can also, and, and also on, on the topic of liver, I mentioned earlier that the liver is also a um, target of graft versus host disease. Um, the lungs also um, can be um, attacked by the immune system and graft versus host disease. Um, also, um, it's not uncommon for people to develop pneumonia or pneumonitis, um, either from generalized inflammation or from viral infections or. Um, or, or other infections. Uh, kidneys are also um, a frequent cause of, or a recipient, if you will, of toxicity. Um, uh, tacrolimus, for example, the major drug that we use for suppressing the immune system, one of its major toxicities is, is um, kidney toxicity. Um, so as a result, we have to very carefully titrate levels of, um, of drug to try and avoid that. Also, also, some of the antibiotics that we use uh, can have kidney toxicity. So it's not uncommon that we're um, trying to deal with or navigate our way around various degrees of, of kidney toxicity. Uh, rarely the heart can um, uh, suffer as a result of, um, for example, chemotherapy um, um, and, and result in inflammation of the heart. Um, um, Fortunately, that's not that common of a, of a scenario. I mentioned uh, mucositis is very common, especially in the peritransplant setting as a result of conditioning. Similarly, the GI tract, um, again, a, a very frequent um, uh, a target of graft versus host disease, and likewise the skin. Um, often dealing with rashes, unfortunately, um, there's no test that tells you that this rash is from that drug or, or, or graft versus host disease. Sometimes skin biopsies can suggest one or the other, but um, often we're making educated assessments of, you know, we just started this antibiotic, let's stop that and see how we do. But um, in the post-transplant setting, rashes are, um, are um, frequently from graft versus host disease. Um, so long-term toxicities of transplants. So second malignancies are, are not uncommon, and part of the supported care that we provide is screening for second malignancies. Things like skin cancers are actually very common post-transplant. We tell all our patients that you know when they're out in the sun, they got to either cover up or put sunscreen on or both to try and reduce the risk of things like squamous cell cancers or basal cell cancers. But really anybody with you know, a sore that doesn't heal, um, we're sending them to the dermatologist for, for biopsy um, in the post-transplant setting. Um, GYN malignancies are also um, seen and spent part of the, the post-transplant um, supportive care is regular uh, GYN exams. Um, mammograms uh, to screen for breast cancer are also important in women. Um, infertility and um, and erectile dysfunction, um, vaginal dryness are all um, very common um, in the post-transplant setting. Infertility in particular is related um, to, um, to the degree or the intensity of prior chemotherapy and condition regimens. Um, skeletal complications are very common, osteoporosis um, and, um, and, and 
sometimes fractures um, are very common, especially in people that are on steroids. Um, uh, steroids are notorious for robbing um, um, the, the bones of the calcium that provides the strength. Uh, so in patients that are on steroids, uh, we routinely send them to an endocrine uh, bone specialist for discussion about um, things like uh, bone preserving um, treatments like Zometa. Um, also, um, uh, muscular, uh, it's very common in people that are on steroids to have um, uh, muscle wasting or weakness. Um, so physical therapy is very important to try and combat that. When people are in the hospital getting their transplant, um, we are um, we really emphasize the importance of getting up and walking around every day to preserve um, the muscle strength. Um, and then psychological um, dysfunction. Um, Depression is very common post-transplant. Um, um, it, it's, in my experience, a lot of people sort of gear up to get through the transplant and then they're through it and a month or two post-transplant, things aren't back to normal and there's this sort of post-climactic um, depression that comes in. So I really encourage people to talk about you know, how they're dealing with things, what their relationships with their families are like. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of, you know, this is also a cause of you know, a, a significant strain on relationships. And, um, we often refer patients to counseling, um, not uncommonly um, have people on antidepressants uh, post-transplant uh, to try and get them through this. So it's a, a shame to get through a transplant and all of the, the, um, that that entails, only to suffer needlessly from some of these other long-term complications that hopefully we can um, uh, try and ameliorate if not uh, prevent. Um, so this gets to the issue of survivorship, and this is, there's a lot of focus has gone into um, trying to enhance um, the long-term quality of life of patients that um, that have gone through transplant um, and things like, as I alluded to, bone health maintenance, post-transplant vaccinations to bolster the immune system um, after engraftment. Typically, don't embark on this for six months to a year, sometimes longer than that. Um, really try, try and avoid it in people that have really active chronic graft versus host disease. Um, but um, important to try and prevent infections if we can <clears throat> through vaccinations. I alluded to um, psychosocial support and also cancer screening as an important part of this post-transplant survivorship effort. Uh, this is the last slide. So, um, uh, so future directions. So we still have a lot of work to do to try and prevent or better treat graft versus host disease. Um, a lot of clinical trials ongoing to try and um, figure out how to, how to do a better job of that. Um, that being said, we've certainly come a long way in, in, um, in that over the years um, with newer medications. It was just a drug approved. Uh, a few months ago, it's the first drug specifically approved for the treatment of steroid refractory graft versus host disease. Um, uh, strategies for relapse, uh, uh, the risk of relapse, uh, or to reduce that risk that um, you had alluded to earlier, the um, um, strategies of, say, maintenance post-transplant. There's a large clinical trial going on right now. Um, through the BMTCTN, um, looking at the use of a targeted agent called gilteritinib um, that targets a specific mutation, seeing about a third of AML patients, to see if the addition of that post-transplant can ameliorate the risk of relapse. So um, that's certainly a, a, a strategy that may um, uh, take, uh, that may uh, reduce that risk in the future. And then there's a lot of work ongoing to try and um, fine tune the, the way that we do um, alternative donor transplants to improve the outcomes of, of that approach. And then I guess the last thing I'll just leave you with is um, this is a treatment that we employ with the intent of cure. And um, unlike a lot of chemotherapy that's given, that's palliative, uh, that the goal is to try and um, 
you know, prolong life, preserve quality of life, but without a real expectation of cure. A stem cell transplant is done with those, the goal of, um, of, of people not only living out their, their lifespan without the disease that, you know, that they have, but also preserving quality of life. And, um, uh, we have a, a celebration here every year of um, patients that have been through stem cell transplantation. And, and it's really the highlight of our of our year to, to get together with all of these patients that we've seen oftentimes through you know through very dire straits and to see them at a social gathering where they're all dressed up and and you know many times um, indistinguishable the guests and the family and the providers um, you, you often can't pick the transplant recipients out of a crowd and that's really what our goal is so Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Westervelt. I just wanted, to, for folks watching at home uh, and everyone here, AAMDS has 124 support groups around the U.S. Some are virtual, some are in real life, um, <laughs> and you can participate. But I think one of the things that doc Dr. Westervelt highlighted was the impact of this on your mental and emotional health as well as that on your loved ones and the people who are in your support circle. And so that's what, if you can't, if, you're, if support groups aren't your thing, Call us. Lee and I love to talk on the phone forever. <laughs> we are happy to do it. In fact, it's the highlight of our day to get to talk to patients. We, we work with 2,500 patients a year between the two of us. So we want to hear from you. We have a 1-800 number. You can send an email to help at aamds.org. But more importantly, if you think that it would be helpful, a support group, or we can hook you up. We play a matchmaker. With our peer support network, we have over 100 volunteers who've been trained um, and are there to support you, whether you're a transplant survivor or um, you are considering it. We're happy to match you up with somebody who might be able to give you some one-on-one -on -one support over the phone or in person. So I'm going to shut. I'm going to close down our, for our friends watching live. And P.S. MDS Ireland, we love you. Um, have a good day, Sinead, and we'll talk to you later. Bye.